we haven't met before, my name is Erin and I run a nursery um, just west of Jackson called Amol Nursery and Farmstead and we have, we purchased that farm about 10 years, ago, three years ago, excuse me, it was 10 years old before we moved there. And so we took over a nursery that was existing and we um, basically have put in our own projects on the farm. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of how we've integrated all these things together. So we're farming, we're running the nursery, and we are just working on our general farm project. So if you've been to our table, we are selling fiber, tinctures, elderberry syrup. We have a background in um, herbs and herbal medicine. So if you go to our nursery, you will see all the annuals for sale, you know, trees and shrubs and general kind of things you would expect in a nursery. And we also carry organic vegetable starts. And this year, our medicinal herb section will be uh, almost 60 plants. So we do sell culinary herbs and we also sell medicinals. So you've kind of heard, I think I feel like every conversation or topic we've talked about today has covered this, this idea of planting for systemic health. And so when you're an herbalist or you're a plant person, it's basically the same conversation. You're looking at a person or you're looking at a plant and you're saying, what does this plant need? It needs certain minerals, it needs certain nutrients in its diet. And so what I'm here to talk to you about is a specific part of the garden and how to bring that conversation into, um, into certain gardening spaces. So we're talking about uh, holistic orcharding and holistic gardening. Does anyone have an old fruit tree? Did anyone inherit an old fruit tree? Is it healthy? Sometimes they're not, right? <laughs> Has anyone wanted to grow fruit? Have you ever felt like you would love to grow some fruit? Absolutely. An apple or a pear or berries or things like that. Well, there are a lot of resources out there for you know, just fruit growing or things, but what you're going to get is put your tree in, wait till it has a disease, then treat the disease. Treat it with a spray, so wait for there to be a problem and then combat it with, you know, a pesticide, an herbicide, fungicide. And what we're looking at here is basically starting from before you have the tree or taking an older tree and creating a, a garden for it. So using the spaces that you have in your yard to integrate things that you want, such as fruit, herbs, medicine, vegetables, and then creating that around your um, orchard space to provide not only nutrients for yourself, for your family, but for the plants. So let's talk about this sort of the, the baseline of every garden is the soil. You've heard the mycelial mat conversation, so you know that there's a fungal component to this. But when you're looking at an orchard environment, what we're talking about is a very specific portion of your yard. So. Um, do any of you have lawns? So you've got some lawn and it's clear. Are there any other things? Do you, are you putting trees or shrubs in your lawn or are you just leaving it for grandkids or whatever? Generally, people have a space, but they're not growing things inside the grass. So what happens is you have a single species, maybe a few weeds or things growing in there. And what happens with a grass-based environment is you have a bacterial-dominated soil. And when you have trees or you have a forest, what you have is a fungally dominated soil because you have all that leaf litter and wood matter falling on the ground and those species now have somewhere. They have food. They have a food Say source. Again, they have shade. You have a bacterial when you have a, a lawn. When you have a, the lawn. Yeah. So when you have a when you have a grass or prairie, even just a natural prairie, those soils shift over depending on the species that live there. So if you have a grass or a prairie environment, those are naturally bacterially dominated soils. And if you have a forest, what you have is a naturally fungally dominated soil because of the matter that is there to be fed on. And that's, that makes perfect sense. There are um, AM fungi, arbusculomycorrhizal fungi, that make associations with grasses and things like that. So it's not that you would have zero fungi in a grass situation, but you're going to have a much lower concentration, a bacterially dominated soil. And what you're gonna try and do is imitate a forest edge. So if you have ever walked a hedgerow or you have a space where your lawn ends and then there's a, a natural spot behind you or something like that, 
that edge right between the grass, the bacterial soil, and the fungal soil is this interactive spot where fruit trees thrive. Mm -hmm. So they have to have sun because disease is part of, um, sorry, shaded trees help aid in disease. So what you're gonna try and do is either transition an orchard that you have that has grass in it to something that has multiple layers. Basically what you're gonna try and do is create a community for your trees. So you're going to create a space around the roots that is wood chips. So you have that mycelial mat happening. You're creating a essentially a root zone that is non-competitive, so you're not having grass coming right up to the base of your trees. You're gonna create a ring two to three feet out. So your tree, your pear, your apple, your whatever you decide goes there, and then you're gonna create this ring where you take out all the grass because young trees do not compete well with grass. And when you have grass, anything that falls down, the grass takes it and the feeder roots for those trees, you have a tap root, but you're also gonna have feeder roots and you need to protect that barrier right around the base of the tree. So whatever I'm telling you to plant does not go within that perimeter. So we start, here's your tree, here's your circular space around it. You take all the grass out. You can just take the sod out and flip it over, which is usually what I do so I don't have to bring in more soil. I cut out my sod and I flip it and then it just decomposes right there and you're good. Then right on top of that, you're gonna take hardwood chips. Nothing from Lowe's, nothing with dyes, nothing from a coniferous forest. If it has a pine scent or any kind of resin, that is not what you're looking for because those are antifungals. Mm -hmm. Any kind of resinous tree has that resin because it's trying to keep insects from eating it. So what you want is a Michigan-based hardwood chip so if you have an asplend tree or an asplend uh, truck on your road, ask them to drop their chips at your house, especially if they're cutting down hardwoods. We have this big mountain of, we had asplend out in the, on our street for a month last summer and we're like, just drop it at the farm. So we have a mountain of chips. If you need a load, you can come to the nursery and just grab it too. If you have one tree, we'll give you some chips. You take your tree, you can go home with them together. Ramiel wood, which is the smaller, the branches, not the wood you would put in your wood stove. That's the drunk wood. The ramiel wood is the branches and smaller, um, smaller bits. So anything a, an inch or smaller is ideal for this project. If you have a wood chipper and you trim your trees, run it through the chipper, let it sit for a little bit and put it under your fruit trees. So we've got our tree, we've got our grass-free mat, We've got our Ramiel wood chips, hardwood chips from somewhere near your house or from our nursery. So you've got your root zone, you've protected your root zone. And after that, you have to think about um, all kinds of things. So you're gonna need pollinators coming into this space. You're going to need housing for those pollinators and you're going to need nectar. So Windy Farm gave a really, really good presentation on providing food for pollinators. You can also provide habitat for pollinators. So on my list, I have a few things such as old nettles, leaving the stalks up, leaving sunflowers up over the winter time so they can overwinter inside those woody stalks. So you have housing. You can do mason bee houses and things like that as well to bring pollinators to this area. You can also deter certain things. So if you have a vole issue or mice or things that come in will chew the base of your trees, you can plant daffodils. You can plant alliums, which are these amazing huge purple bulbs. You can plant your garlic. So what I'm trying to say is look at this space, look at this orchard and say, this is a garden. Everything I put into this space, all this open area that I was keeping clear to like make sure I could mow, just, just ditch the mower. If you need a mower, get a sheep, okay? They need the same shed. You don't have to give them any fuel and they'll just eat your grass and then you can eat them. Just one sheep. <laughs> and then you can go on vacation too. You don't have to do anything. So what we're gonna call this is messy gardening. It doesn't matter so much that it's orderly. What it matters is that I'm creating this community of plants and everything in this community has value. So I have a dandelion. Should I spray it? Probably not, it has a tap root. It's pulling nutrients from the depths of the earth and bringing them to an area where other plants can, ac can access them. So for a dandelion, specifically potassium. 
anything that's having the going down to the ground is going to bring up minerals. Just like the mycelial mats can go and find minerals and provide them to plants, other plants can do that as well, especially deep-rooted. There are a few plants I'm going to mention today that people would consider weeds. I'm going to go through those quickly and tell you why you should not hurt these plants. One, a lot of them are medicinal for you. Others are medicinal for your plants. You can make herbal teas and sprays for your plants, especially your fruit trees, and help create some balance when you have fungal issues, you have bacterial issues on your leaves. You can take your herbal sprays and spray your trees with your herbal teas, and you're helping create balance just like you would by using a probiotic in your own body. So you're taking probiotics in to help balance bad bacteria that also colonize your system trees are the same. So you can use a garlic, you can use a comfrey, you can use nettles, and you can use, this is something most people don't grow, but you could forage, a uh, horsetail. And all of those are providing not only a bacterial or fungal balance on the leaves, they are providing habitat and they are providing you with medicine. Nettles are extremely nutritious for human beings. You can cook them, you can make teas with them, you can make tinctures with them. Um, comfrey is medicinal for humans, although you wouldn't take it internally, you can use it topically. Comfrey is a highly nutritious plant for goats and sheep. If you have sick animals in your vicinity and they're not doing well, often they will eat comfrey because it's so nutritious. You can put it in a bucket and ferment it and spray it on your plants. It's one of those things that if you put these in your yard, do not come to me and say, you told me to do this. Because any of these, they're extremely competitive. They will spread, nettles especially. You don't want to put it in an area where you have grandchildren. But if you have kind of a swampy area and you don't really have anything going on in there, some nettles, and you've got forage for yourself and your family, and you've got medicine. So there are other parts of nettles you can do so many things with, but we'll just move on really quickly. Comfrey, if you look, I brought some books and some resources for you. If you look in some of these books, they've got comfrey right, uh, right outside that, that three foot ring under your trees, they've got comfrey because you can chop it and drop it and that's your manure, that's your organic compost. It flops over itself after heavy rain, so sometimes you don't even have to chop it down. Same thing with nettles, you can go through and chop it wearing gloves, of course, and then just leave it and when it decomposes, it's taking all of its mineral content and spreading it on your soil. So that just is lowering over time the amount of work that you are providing of your own physical labor. You're letting these plants do the work for you by providing the nutrients that they bring to the table. Um, Underseeding with alfalfa, even in your grass, or if you're thinking of just mowing some spots and then leaving some, sowing alfalfa, nitrogen. That's a really important one. Um, pea shrubs, you can purchase those, but if you've got alfalfa and you can just throw the seed out and it can compete with the grass and you've got some clover, these are nitrogen fixing and you're doing nothing. And if you have that one sheep, you're providing really, really good forage for it as well. Um, another thing you can look at is multi-layering in these plant communities and providing yourself and um, your trees with uh, protection from certain species. Sorry, I'm trying to tell you two, two things at once. One, you can provide yourself with food. Two, you can provide your plants with protection from uh, not beneficial insects. So things like thyme, marjoram, lavender, really volatile oil heavy plants that you could then use for your, you can dry the herbs and save them, you can make teas, you can make your own medicines. I have some that you might not use for medicine but are also smelly and are going to keep insects away are wormwood. This is absinthe. There's probably not a lot of you making your own absinthe at home. Um, anise hyssop, which is such a good nectar source and is a huge, beautiful perennial. Um, rue, really stinky, really good at warding off, uh, what are those called, Japanese beetles. Um, even geraniums, scented geraniums especially, anything that's got oils and if you're walking through there, you're also providing yourself with some bug protection. Um, gentian, which is used to make a digestive bitters and is a beautiful blue flower. It's deep blue. It's been used for a hundred years to make a digestive bitters. Um, tansy, which 
not most people would think about putting in their garden, but if you already have it, if you have it near your plants, coddling moth, hate tansy. If you have a fruit problem, you might consider, you know, creating a spot for something that most people would consider a weed. It's definitely toxic to livestock though, so some of those things you have to keep in mind if you do have animals coming through. Um, nasturtium. <laughs> as a warding off, so it's peppery. People don't want to eat it necessarily, sorry, but you can. The flower is edible, the leaves are edible. Not everybody loves that bite that it has, but it's also good at warding off. Um, woolly apple aphid specifically. So lower understory production for yourself could also be strawberries and rhubarb and horseradish. Again, ground cover, strawberries, rhubarb, something you can grow as an understory and is okay with producing earlier in the season when you don't have the shade, and then providing yourself with jam. <laughs> it's very important, jam source. <laughs> Horseradish is another taproot, so it's bringing minerals up. You're utilizing those minerals when you eat it, but you're also producing ground cover and cover for insects. Um, let's see, other perennials for beneficial insects, goldenrod, meadowsweet, Chervil daisies, aster family, really, really good for um, bringing in pollinators and feeding them. Uh, lemon balm, such an important one, especially if you're um, an herbalist or you're just learning about herbs. Lemon balm you should absolutely bring into your plant family. Lemon balm shortbread cookies. Can we just talk about this? It's very important. <laughs> um, Lovage, which is an interesting herb. I don't know if any of you grow celery, but lovage is kind of a middle. It's an umble, so it creates that big, wide flower. We happen to like those at Umble Nursery, so we grow a lot of them. Uh, Queen Anne's Lace is another example of that wide flower, so that's providing for those little tiny wasps and other little beneficial insects that can collect pollen from a really small flower source. Oh, let's see. Lovage is kind of like a celery, a perennial celery substitute. So when I go to make a soup in the summer, sometimes I'm like, I don't have any celery, but I have this perennial lovage. It's a strong celery flavor. It's kind of like celery parsley. You can go and clip off a few and you've got your substitute for if you forgot to get your stuff from the grocery store. Um, purple coneflower, also very medicinal, and angelica, which is another uh, umbel. So it's just another nectar source. So another thing that they mention in some of the books that I've brought to show you are a lower story layer of shrubbery that you could use as a kind of an outer thing. And this is also for habitat. But one of the other reasons they bring it is to woody material for chop and drop. So some of that ramial wood chip material and just having wooden material to help bring in and maintain your mushroom population. <laughs> it's a secret door. <laughs> so once again, a few more herbs I want to mention are sage and chives. So go ahead and get your herbs and put them in your orchard is really what I'm, this is the idea of this entire conversation. Use your understory and make it work for your benefit and also for your plants. Um, and the last bit I wanted to talk to you about were shrubby fruit production. You can grow those on the edge of your orchard and also in the understory depending on how much sun they need. But if you've got an orchard and you've got just a little bit of space, some of the others that they mentioned using as, this might be a little far-fetched, but if you're also a weaver, you can make baskets from some of these. So we have red osher, dogwood, and willow. These are trees that can be coppiced. If you know what coppicing is, it means taking a shrub and cutting everything back every year. So you're getting whips every year and those are prized by weavers. So if you have pollen source from your willow, you can let them flower and then cut those off. You can weave your own baskets. I like to use willow and red osher dogwood specifically for floral arrangements. So you know what, just another consideration is once again, is aesthetics come into gardening as well. You can take your red osher dogwood and do those winter planters where you've got your birch log and your conifer branches and then you've got those red sticks. That's a red osher dogwood. Willow, there's also a yellow twig dogwood 
and there's yellow willow, there's black willow. So the color of the stems themselves can be used. Sometimes they're bundled and sold to florists. So if you like, you're doing your own flower arrangements and you have kind of a cut flower garden, some, um, some shrubbery can fall into that category as well. All right, last bit, other shrubs. So sometimes, I don't know if you guys have tried planting orchards in Southern Michigan, it can be a bit of a challenge. Just want you to keep in mind that even though the rose family exists in North America, apples and pears are not native to this area. So if you find that it just isn't working for you, I have a list of some alternative fruits that you might be interested in. They're hard to keep track of. They're hard to keep up with. They do require a lot of maintenance. So I just wanted to say, set yourself up as best you can, but don't beat yourself up if your trees do get disease. It just happens. And when we have those things, sometimes we do have to say, how much time do I really have for this project? I still want fruit. What can I do? And once again, blueberries are also an issue here because we don't have the acidic soil. So you can take those things into consideration. You can just say, for the amount of time that I have, I'm gonna make gooseberry jam. I'm gonna make currants. Whatever you can fit into your lifestyle. We also, one of the things that we've really found a lot of success with is growing elderberries. That is medicinal in many ways and it still is a native and it's very easy to grow. So elderberry tree shrub. So we're thinking very large, eight to 10 foot, some even bigger. So leave some space for that one. Viburnums, willows, red alders, gooseberries, currants. New Jersey tea, which is just another native shrub, which can be used on the edges. And if you're feeling like you wanna mess with your soil pH and do that, blueberries. So I hope I've given you a few things to talk about. I just wanted to let you know that everything that people have mentioned today is part of this conversation. So creating um, soil with your mushroom allies, your pollinator allies, making sure that you're keeping in mind that all of these things are there to help you. They're not working against you necessarily. And the more habitat you provide for that, the more benefit you're going to get for yourself. So we have a nursery. You can see us in May. We sell almost everything on this list. I have a handout for you. You can always reach out and it looks like uh, Windy Farm, Rock. Nursery, Windy Rock, I'm sorry. Windy Rock Farm has some of these also like New Jersey tea, which is really hard for me to find from a commercial nursery. <clears throat> if you can find a local source for some of these native things, I really recommend that you place them in your garden. And like you said, they're really low maintenance too. So you can have all that extra time to work on your fruit trees. <laughs> Thank you so much. I won't go over.